Draco Malfoy and the Mortifying Ordeal of Being in Love by Is This Self-Care? Narrated by S.E.P. Chapter 20 Draco Malfoy the Errand Boy Life and Times of Draco needn't have worried about Granger fussing. That was the problem with healers. They had seen too much, and a minor issue like a lethal envenoming was of little interest, really, when it was on the mend. Granger opened the front door, observed his neck from a polite distance, pronounced herself pleased that it was healing so nicely, and then asked him what he wanted. There was no romance about Granger, no luring her into coy guessing or eyelash fluttering suppositions. She was terribly pragmatic. Well, said Granger, is something the matter? Draco produced the flowers. Oh, gasped Granger, with the expression of surprised delight that Draco was coming to find rather addictive. And no, they're not sprout from McLagan's corpse. Of course they didn't, said Granger, accepting the bouquet. They are far too beautiful. Draco gave her a small bow. With my mother's compliments, she's attached a letter for you. I am also to convey my exuberant thanks to you for saving my life. Please tell her I did so if she asks. Your ebulence quite knocked me off my feet. Perfect. Do I put them in water? asked Granger, holding the gently fluttering bouquet to her face. I believe my mother charmed them to last, but I suppose it couldn't hurt. Granger disappeared into the cottage. You can come in if you'd like, she called, if you haven't any other plans. My only other plans involve being smothered by elves, Granger tutted, poor darling, which was the second time that a woman had teased Draco for his hardships today, and he felt rather put upon. I shall offer you a very standard cup of tea, said Granger. Will that be refreshing after all of the coddling you've endured? Quite. Make it subpar, even. I'll forget to boil the water. Excellent, said Draco, seating himself on the kitchen chair. Granger transfigured a vase out of a glass. The fluttering, glittering bouquet was put in pride of place upon the kitchen worktop. Her cat leapt up beside it and touched at the moving petals with a curious paw. Lovely, said Granger. I'll have to work out how to charm it to follow me around, depending on what room I'm in, so that way I can look at it all the time. I'll inform my mother. That will flatter her. Granger discovered the envelope. Shall I read her letter now or later? Later, please, said Draco. I've heard quite enough about her relief that her treasured stun is still alive. Granger duly set the letter aside. She wants you to quit the aura business, you know. She is quite disgusted with it. I know. She never loved it to begin with. The Nundu incident is the closest I've come to dying on the job. Bit of a shock for her. Granger, who had been idly touching the hummingbird hyacinths, turned to him with a grimace of guilt. I feel terrible about it. You? Why? You saved me. Yes, but if I hadn't bodged your first attempt to catch Talfrin, none of this would have happened. True, conceded Draco. Then he added, I should like an apology from your otter. Granger's look was mingled uncertainty and amusement. Draco held her gaze with a raised eyebrow. Granger sighed, then took out her wand and cast Expecto Patronum. Her otter floated to Draco and looked as contrite as an otter could. I'm sorry, said the otter. You're forgiven, said Draco with great benevolence. The otter rolled its eyes, if you please, and then disappeared. The absolute cheek of that creature, said Draco. He turned back to Granger. Mind you, if you hadn't bungled my first attempt, I would have only caught Talfrin. We ended up cuffing twenty baddies. Perhaps it evens out. Twenty? Tonks must be well pleased. She is. She offered to give me the pick of the letter for my next mission, as a reward. And take me off this protection assignment. The last bit Draco added conversationally, out of a kind of curiosity, to see if Granger would react in any sort of interesting way of the news. Granger, who had been occupied with tea things, stilled. Did she? Yes. Granger startled at the kettle. Her back was to Draco, but there was a tension in her shoulders. And? What did you say? I said no. Her shoulders released. Oh, did you? She said with studied nonchalance. Yes. Are you pleased? I can't tell. Granger turned. Her face was carefully neutral. I think it's good news, she said, addressing a space somewhere above Draco's head. I won't have to get used to someone else popping around at all hours. You know. And besides, you're, you're very good at what you do. Not that I think your colleagues couldn't do as fine a job. They were interrupted by the cat making a leap from the worktop to Draco's lap. Uh, said Draco. Granger looked bemused. Crooks, what are you doing, you silly thing? You're going to get hair all over him. As though it had been reminded of this central imperative in its life, the cat took a few steps toward Draco's chest, rubbed itself against his fine black robes, its tail swept under his chin. 
Is that... is that purring? asked Draco, feeling a powerful rumble emanating from the cat. Oh, yes. It's measurable on the Richter scale when he does it. Can I stroke him, or will he bite my hand off? You could try, said Granger, though there was doubt in her voice. The cat permitted a brief scratch under its chin. Then it clambered up Draco's chest, onto his shoulder, and onto his head, which served as a launching point for a self above. It settled, loaf-like, between a jar of flour and some dried herbs, and observed him with his yellow eyes. Draco fixed his hair, which had never been so ignominiously used. I forgot to forget to boil the water, said Granger, serving the tea in two steaming mugs. And you... are you pleased? I know the protection assignment wasn't the preferred outcome for either of us. I'm rather surprised you decided to keep it. Draco stirred milk into his tea, which gave him time to think of a nice and neutral response. I wouldn't pass my family ring into another aura, which is the only way to keep the protection minimally intrusive for you. Oh, yes, that is very appreciated. And I'd like to see this thing through to the end, said Draco, now that we've come this far. A completionist. Occasionally. The end might be a long way away, Granger was observing him over her tea with a kind of veiled anxiousness. Another six months, if all goes well. Draco shrugged. It's July. What's another six? Has it really already been half a year? Yes, I took the assignment in January. Granger propped her chin on her hand. She looked thoughtful. Six entire months. Where did the time go? And we've only tried to kill each other two or three times. We're doing all right. Your latest attempt was the most successful to date, said Draco with a gesture at his neck. If that had been on purpose, you'd be quite dead, I assure you, said Granger. How did you heal it? Mother said you did muggle things. Granger eyed him as though deciding how much dumbing down he would need to require in order her explanation. Well, as soon as you mentioned that there was a nundu on English soil, I thought it would be useful to do a bit of research. Of course you did. No magical hospital in the UK, nor the entirety of Europe, is equipped to handle nundu venom, much less little old St. Mungo's. I didn't think anything would go wrong, necessarily, but I knew how terribly unprepared we would be if something did, so I had a venom sample imported. Draco narrowed his eyes. Did that sample happen to arrive when I was in your office? Yes. Pet project, my arse. It was a pet project. For all I knew, it was going nowhere. There was no known antivenom, after all. Granger, who had been sitting at the table, pushed off from it and waved her wand and began to warm up to her lecture. Diagrams, vials, and molecules came to life around her. Nundu venom is a potent neurotoxin known as alarectin, this purple one. When I was reading up on its effects, they sounded nearly identical to non-magical biotoxin called phen phenotoxin, the orange one. It's a predatory venom. I did a spot of lab work to confirm the synonymity. A spot of lab work? My laboratory happens to be unusually well-equipped to investigate these things, and I was curious. It was remarkably close. They're almost indistinguishable. These toxins both operate by, oversimplifying terribly, blocking sodium channels in the motor nerves. They can cause almost complete motor paralysis and respiratory arrest within minutes of the dose. One of the mazoologists told us a single milligram of nandu venom can kill an adult within hours. Correct. If you're lucky your team got you to St. Mungo's as quickly as they did. Anyway, there are experimental muggle treatment protocols established for phenotoxin, and, well, given that it was that or your imminent death, I administered them. Neostigmine, coleasterase inhibitors, alpha adrenergic agonists. Granger conjured two more diagrams for Draco's edification. Then, a tiny figure representing him popped into existence, complete with white blonde hair. Not an antivenom, technically, but your body could antagonize repeated allorectin challenges until the venom broke down and was excreted from your system. Now the tiny Draco was sweating, and... Is he having a wee? asked Draco. Yes, said Granger. A tiny nurse walked by and patted the tiny Draco on the head. He got up and did a tiny dance of joy. Then they both faded from existence. A slowly spinning allorectin molecule still glowed in violet next to Granger. Her finger was on her lip as she studied it. Yet another fascinating bit of intersectionality between muggle and magical therapeutic approaches. Those in-betweens are woefully unexplored. But, well, there's only one me. Still, can you imagine an artificial antigen to combat nandu venom? An antitoxic serum? It would serve both worlds. She drifted off in thought, then blinked, seemed to remember that Draco was in the room, and resumed her chair. I've left notes for a treatment protocol at St. Mungo's. They're going to share them with our colleagues in Tanzania. However, 
My hope is that Nundo and Venoming on English soil will remain a rare occurrence. You really are something else, said Draco, observing her with his chin propped on his knuckles. Granger glanced up from her mug and caught a stare. Stop looking at me like that. Like what? said Draco, softening his eyes further and allowing a vague smile to creep upon his features. Like you're all... all dazzled. Why? It unsettles me. Isn't everyone dazzled by you? Yes, but with you, it's perturbing. But I am dazzled. Mesmerized, even. Granger gave him an annoyed glare. Professor. With a sound of irritation, Granger rose and went to refill her mug. Draco thought that she looked flustered, which was interesting. Anyway, you'll go down in history as the Auror who fought an undo and lived, said Granger over the sound of pouring water. Feel I ought to receive a trophy. Or a plaque, Draco paused, then added, No, if anyone's receiving plaques, it should be you. I didn't really do anything but walk into a stream of venom, fresh from the source. I have so many plaques, I haven't any idea what to do with them. A smart arse once told me that my collection is a mosaic, you know. What a clever and amusing observation, said Draco. He thought so, too. Having apparently decided that Draco's unnerving stare had sufficiently abated, Granger returned to the table. I'm to ask you if you have any orphans or other noble causes to support, said Draco. My mother and I wish to add our considerable clout to whatever issue is near and dear to your heart. That is entirely unnecessary, said Granger with a decisiveness that would have offended Narcissa. I was only doing my job. Wrong answer. Think of something. Host a nasal information booth. Be serious. Granger looked at him, saw that he was, himself, being serious, and sighed. I reiterate that I was merely doing my job. Right, but maybe a bit above and beyond, said Draco, echoing Granger's sentiments in a faraway foyer. Psh. No, not at all, with that bit of extracurricular research on the side? Perhaps a little, said Granger, holding back a smile. I see that I have to watch my tongue with you, lest my own words be used against me. Likewise, said Draco, because it was true. So what will it be? We'd be delighted to contribute to your research fund. I'm told it's eye-wateringly expensive to run a laboratory. Make it a contribution to St. Mungo's, rather, if you must. Not to your own research? No, it would do much more immediate good at St. Mungo's, I think. Any word in particular? Granger paused to think. What kind of sum do you have the generous Malfoy's got in mind? Large, said Malfoy. You saved my life. Quantify large. You'll find out. Granger narrowed her eyes at him. Then please direct it to the Janus Thickey Ward for the hospital's long-term residents. It's terribly tired and dingy. Done. As a general comment, it would be nice if there were more windows. All right. More private suites, too. A studio for exercising, a piano, a small library. A swimming pool? The final item was proposed with kind of a questioning hesitation. Draco raised an eyebrow at her. Ranger held up her hands. What? You said large and didn't define it. I promise my definition of large will not disappoint. I will hold judgment until I see something concrete, said Granger. I know. You prefer hard evidence. Exactly. They eyed each other. Then Draco asked, Are we still talking about money? Obviously, said Granger, looking prim. For a moment, he thought he saw the ghost of a grin, but if it had been there, she mastered it quickly. I've noted all of your requests, said Malfoy, except the bloody swimming pool. I think they haven't the room. What on earth would you want a swimming pool for? Fancy a dip between patients? Oh, not for me, said Granger. Hydrotherapy is wonderful for many ailments. Chronic pain, exercising post-surgery, treating nerve damage or spinal injuries. And for the long-term residents with significant deconditioning, it's a brilliant way to ease them back into physical activity. But gently. I know I'm dreaming, but you did say large. Now Granger lapsed into a daydream, her thoughts far away in some unrealized Janus Thickey ward, where joyful patients pranced about in an exercise studio and played the piano and did swan dives into the pool. She was starry-eyed, her hands clasped under her chin, a smile on her lips. She hadn't even taken him up on the offer to fund her own research. Did she have to be so good, so giving, so pure? In a moment that was as epiphanic as it was startling, Draco realized that it wasn't him or any other pure blood who was pure. Granger was purer than any of them, in every way that mattered, of heart and of mind, of purpose. No family tree or convoluted intermarriages or tapestries, only purity of intent. He looked about, half expecting a herd of unicorns to descend upon her cottage to be stroked by her. Although, frankly, at this point, 
Even a new coat of paint and a cheering charm on Healer Crutchley would be a vast improvement, said Granger, returning to the present. I should ambush her and do it myself. She noticed Draco's silent stare. What? Waiting for the unicorns to arrive, said Draco. The unicorns? Nothing, said Draco. Never mind. Granger rose to take their empty mugs to the sink, eyeing him over her shoulder with suspicion. Draco also rose to bring their spoons, even if he could have just as easily levitated them over. But she was doing it by hand, and he was in her house, so he did as she did, and it wasn't an excuse to remain in her vicinity at all. This fine reasoning concluded, Draco sought a new topic of conversation. Did the book end up being useful? It was an extremely successful choice. Yes! Granger clapped her hands together. It did! Well, I'm glad he had unlocked a floodgate of enthusiasm. Granger dragged him to the front room before he could finish a sentence. The new copy of Revelations was on a plinth, covered by stasis charms and a small inventory of alarm wards. Now Granger spoke in rapid-fire excitement. You saw how the damage my own copy was. Don't lie, I know you did. I had perhaps 30% of the text in its integral form. I was able to make certain educated inferences, but I would have soon hit a dead end. She waved away the charms, cast some sort of protective spell on her hands, and opened the book. In this copy, the second half is almost completely intact. Look, look, spectacular. I've never dreamed that another copy existed. I thought it would only be half so well preserved. Having the entire thing at my disposal has been a gift, a gift. I can't thank you enough. I could just, I could just squeeze the life out of you, she finished, wringing her hands in lieu of. The words were out of Draco's mouth before he could stop them. You can, you know. I can what? Squeeze the life out of me. He hadn't expected the force of her launch. She jumped to reach his neck, locked her arms around him, and squeezed him into a hug of earnest gratitude. He wrapped a single polite arm around her, to keep balance or something. She smelled like tea and sugar, and she felt delightful against him. One day, said Granger somewhere in his neck, I'll explain to you why this matters so much. Draco waited for his tongue to supply him with a witty response, but he found himself experiencing an absolute lexical blank. Nothing witty was forthcoming. Nothing unwitty, either. He was as good as stunned. He made a tactical error in glancing down, and then he saw her warm eyes and her smile, and, oh no. Now he wanted to wrap his other arm around her, truly, not this half arse thing he had going, and lift her up, make it a real hug, a whole body thing, full frontal contact. That's what he wanted, and maybe deposit her on the back of the sofa. It seemed the right sort of height, and then, other things. He did not do these things, because he was not an idiot, and she would run away shrieking, probably slap him. It was Granger. Granger, satisfied with her squeeze, released him and returned to the book, utterly unperturbed, while Draco stood wordlessly like a tongue-tied cretin. She returned to enthusiastic guided tour of the tome, pointing to some marks along the edges of the pages. Even the marginalia is undamaged. That's a few hundred years' worth of commentary. Layers and layers of it. Fascinating. Look, Malfoy, you aren't looking. I'm looking, said Draco. He was a liar. He was floating off somewhere in the furthest reaches of the universe in a happy daze. Granger continued her demonstration. The illuminations on this page are really sumptuous. Do you think that's real silver leaf? Uh, could be, said Draco. His bloodstream was awash with feel-good hormones. He was 13 years old, and a girl had hugged him. There was time turning afoot. That's what this was about. There was no other explanation for being so stupidly giddy about a single stupid hug. Gorgeous, said Granger, pointing to another illumination, a green dragon. That's from the legend of St. George. And there's his cross, the red and white bit. Right. Granger seemed to sense that she had lost her audience's attention. With a small and happy sigh, she shut the book. I've almost finished digitizing the entire thing. Then I'll have this copy sent to the library at King's Hall. The head librarian will fall out of her chair. I was going to offer it under your name. Make it a joint gift, rather, said Draco. Done, said Granger. She waved the stasis charm around the tome back to life. We'll give the head librarian another reason to fall out of her chair. How so? Our names? Together? On a gift? She'll think one of us lost a bet. Letter. Better than the lurid truth about blackmail and reparations from McLagan's nurse fantasies. Draco grimaced. At least Malfoy Granger had a decent ring to it. I beg your pardon. It would be Granger Malfoy, if it was going to be anything. Alphabetical. 
Granger's sentence dropped off as she attempted to smother a, a wide yawn. Draco took the hint. I should be off. Sorry, said Granger, yawning again. She accompanied him to the door. Positively knackered. You look it. Charming, thank you. Draco could have voiced a secret truth about how fatigue somehow became her. How the smudges under her eyes spoke of the tireless work of a brilliant mind. How her haphazard plate looked fetchingly artless and invited the play of fingers all amongst escaped tendrils. He could have. He didn't. He was stupid. Granger opened the front door. Draco passed her to get out with a fleeting brush of his arm against the shoulder. He stepped into the moon-bathed July night, sweet with the full scent of summer. Has anyone told you that you might be stretching yourself too thin? asked Draco. Mm, yes. Not even an hour ago. At the pub. Good. Did Harry and Ron put you up to reinforcing their message? Or Neville? Ginny? Draco scoffed. I wouldn't serve as their messenger, boy. I am happy that they noticed and aren't abysmally useless friends. Oh, because you and your friends are the quintessence of self-love and support, said Granger, raising a brow at him. Absolute paragons, Granger. <sighs> Granger was framed by the golden glow of the cottage behind her. Soft lights and a fire in the hearth. Her shadow flickered across the stoop. Draco's shadow was darker. Cast from behind, a moon shadow intersecting delicately with hers. He watched the twine and unwind of their shadow selves as Granger shifted to a lean. It was a strange thing, because she was tired, and he was on his way out, and yet it felt like they were both lingering. He wanted to linger. It was sweet to linger, to stand under fading wisteria, watching their mingling shadows, and bicker about unimportant things. There was something terribly precious about it. Perhaps because it was unnecessary. It was for the pleasure of it. It was just because. He watched her for a shift, for a sign of impatience, but there was none. Only a hip against the door jam, an arm held loosely at her waist. She was talking about his mother now, asking him to tell her that she adored the flowers. He said something in return, something that she could respond to, to continue to stretch out the moment. She laughed at something. Their eyes met. Draco felt woolly-headed and vague. It was the anesthesia again, the feel of the world in flux, a slow spinning. Granger was idly plucking a few strands of wisteria. He asked if that was the extent of her flower arranging. She said yes. Was he impressed? And she passed him the droopy bouquet. He said it was the loveliest thing he had ever seen. He reached to take it. He drew his fingertips past hers. In his veins, not blood, but lightness. His touch lingered probably too long. He wondered what to call this thing, this stealing of glances and touches and moments. The headlong giddiness impelled by the most platonic of hugs. The wanting to be near. He wasn't foolish enough to call it love, and it was too delicate for lust. But it wasn't nothing. It was something. Yes, unless he was very much mistaken, there was something between himself and Granger. And wouldn't that just be an exquisite catastrophe?